Hey, this is HuffPost Live. I'm Ricky Camilleri. Lincoln Park has been cranking out hits for almost two decades now, and the band is back on the road for the Carnivores Tour in support of their new album, The Hunting Party. Rap vocalist Mike Shinoda joins us as one half of a creative couple. His wife, Anna, is here as well. She's the author of the new book, Learning Not to Drown. Both of you, welcome. And congratulations on the new album, on the book. I should also say, you are not only the rap vocalist of Lincoln Park, <laughs> right? Yeah, um, well, I guess fa I, a lot of people say, like, founder of the band or whatever. I mean, we started the band back in the late 90s, and uh, it was just me and a friend of mine in my, my, my parents' house, basically my bedroom, just making stuff on cassette four track. <laughs> um, and then it eventually became a, a thing where, you know, hey, are you guys going to play any of this music live? And so we just started asking our friends, you know, who could fill in the roles of bass, guitar, and so on. And luckily we had all of the key uh, instrumentalists mm -hmm. and, and the talent there. Um, with one exception, we did meet Chester a little bit later. We met him a couple of years later. And, and oh, that's him on the screen right now. <laughs> that's, that's so interesting to go from uh, a f recording four-track cassette tapes to producing songs with, with Jay-Z and having some of the sort of slickest production that you could possibly have within, yeah. uh, within the music industry. I mean that as a, as a, as a compliment. Mm -hmm. But like, how was that as a transition for you? Um, well, you know, we've always just tried to, I, I was going to say tried to just e evolve with, with the, you know, the times, the technology, etc. But I don't think we have to make much of an effort. Um, we just, it's something that, as you know, we all just do. Right. And new things come out and we play with them, we try them, and, and whether that's, you know, social media or it's, it's, you know, the technology we use in the studio or on stage. Right now, we're on tour, as you said, with the Carnivores tour supporting the new album. And it's a really interesting time for us because with the album, we went back to a more um, heavy rock, visceral style. We recorded it in a more, um, kind of like a more old school kind of approach, at least for us. It started with a lot of analog tape and stuff like that, which is, uh, not stuff like that. The approach in recording analog tape is different than the approach of recording digital, at least for us. So it was more of an old school approach mixed with a very modern digital approach mashed together. And that's what the album was. We now are taking that to the stage, and with each show, it's the same thing. There's like a you know very organic band-oriented live performance aspect, but also some very high-tech um, video components, some high-tech musical components going on stage in order to bring all of our songs from the last you know however many years, 14, 15 years, uh, to the stage. And you also have, an, and I want to get to the book in just a second. I, I don't want to derail this part of the conversation. Uh, that quickly, but you also have some amazing guest stars on this album as well, right? You have Tom Morella, you have you you have uh, Paige from Helmet. I love yeah. Helmet. Yeah. Uh, that's such a cool addition. What's it like for you guys at this point? I mean, these were people of the generation just before you in terms of rock status. What's it like for you guys to get what I would imagine are kind of your inspirations and heroes? Yeah, that's right, album? and that's what that was one of the reasons why we wanted to um, ask them to participate is just that that's kind of what we grew up on, and we wanted. Um, the album had those elements in it. I, th I felt like when we were writing this album, a lot of um, the stuff that's on the radio, at least right now, is, is it's very different from this. Is there, most notably, there wasn't that kind of aggression. And, and when I do go out and listen to rock music now and, and, and I find stuff that's more you know, heavy or, or aggressive music, it tends to be, um, in, it tends to fall into certain lanes. And those lanes don't include bands like Helmet and At The Drive-In and um, uh, so many others. And, and so those were the, the, the kind of things that we wanted to kind of bring back out in our music and, and maybe, maybe to some degree show to our fans and say, hey, have you thought about these bands? You know, check out these right. bands too. Absolutely. Look at our influences there. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So Anna, uh, Learning Not to Drown this book, you, 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 was the, the essay that you wrote, Dear Teen Me, was that the inspiration for the book or was that written just after the book? I wrote that after I wrote the book, um, but the, the inspiration for the book was I, I did grow up with a brother in and out of prison, mm -hmm. and at one point I had to look at my family from uh, the aspect of looking at the truth of what had happened, and um, that was really difficult. And so the Dear Teen Me was kind of a postscript of written after the book was finished when I was trying to think of what is the way that I want to present this to the world? Mm -hmm. um, because it is a work of fiction, but it comes from a very real, raw, emotional place from me. So uh, Was that's it cathartic kind of, for you to, to, to write that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
I've, you know, therapy helped the most out of anything. <laughs> well, it was really cathartic but, with but, talking to my therapist. Right, yeah. right, absolutely. But, um, but being able to kind of arrange the ideas, put them down, and also having a character, making up a character, and and having her be able to go through um, certain things in her life, it's it's easier for her to see the truth mm -hmm. than it is sometimes for yourself to see the truth. So in that process, I was able to kind of see the, the truth in my own life because I was forcing uh, a character who I made up to see the truth in her own life. Do you guys work together creatively? Are you each other's number one fans? Do you share lyrics? Do you share beats? Do you share new chapters, new, new ideas? Uh, and when you do do that, does that sort of help your relationship, or do you find that sometimes it, it, can, it can hurt your relationship <laughs> a little bit? Um, Mike's almost always one of my first readers. Uh, I, don't, I don't let people see work until I'm ready. Mm -hmm. And when I'm ready, I show it to a group of people who are other writers who we critique each other's work. But then I, I also show it to Mike and um, get his feedback as well. And uh, he's, he's great at Thanks. getting feedback. Um, he's especially great with the, the male perspective on things. Anna was really, uh, I remember we had a bunch of conversations about learning not to drown. And, and by the way, she worked on this book for like 10 years. Yeah. yeah. So it was, um, it, you know, every few, I'd say every few months, she'd, she'd show me a draft and I'd see, you know, changes and stuff. And that was one of the things that she was working on as she went into it is um, you'll notice that the characters are not definitively like one ethnicity or they're not, you know, um, it's not a book that's necessarily for um, male or female. It's really like she did, I, I thought she put a lot of effort into trying to, to make it universally, uh, make it more of a universal story. And, and in doing so, she'd, she'd read me these, or she'd give me these, these, you know, portions of it that really focused on a guy's voice or the, you know, when the main character Claire is speaking to a boy. And I'd help her and say like, no, guy, I, like, I, I would never say that. Or I wouldn't, you know, it, it wouldn't be top of like most of my guy friends right. radar, like what Claire was, you know, her fingernails or her, her, what she's wearing or whatever. Like, well, get in tune in, with it, man. Get sensitive, <laughs> come so, on. I, just, I don't think it was an insensitive thing. I think that, I think that it was, um, what was nice about it is uh, for me, at least, we did have those conversations. We said, like, well, what kind of, you know, what kind of personality do you want this person to have? And right. she was able to, in, in, and I think this is a, um, my understanding, this is a common thing for a lot of creative people, especially writers, is, you know, you're, you're, you're taking from stuff that's real. You're taking from inspiration that maybe it's a real person. Like, this character is kind of loosely based on, like, two of my friends, or this character is based on my brother, or this character is based on whatever. And then you take that and you make it, Almost like you make it greater than the, the, the real life story or you boil it down to its essentials and tell the story that you want to push the right emotional buttons for people. We do that in our music. Right. Chester and I haven't lived the same life and we're both vocalists in the band and we both write the lyrics together. And so when we write something, we have to make sure that we are both emotionally invested and emotionally um, like responding to the words that are, that are being written. So whereas, you know, one thing I might, we might write a thing and to me it's like, oh yeah, that, that, that reminds me of a situation with my, you know, my best friend in high school. He says, oh, well, this reminds me of like this situation with my brother. And it was like, this, is, this one is about a um, falling out and this one is about, um, you know, a disagreement about the family and so on. It's like some, some things that are completely different. Right. But you're coming to them, the, the, the words are written in a way that, it's almost like multi-purpose. Mm -hmm. it, it takes a lot of trust uh, to share with your with your with your wife, your husband, your your partner, uh, what you're working on creatively, and to get feedback, critical feedback. Did you guys have to come to find that trust looking at each other's work, or do you feel like you already had it when you started sharing? I, I think that we already had it. We first of all, we've been together since 1998, so that's six. Uh, how many years? Yes. I don't know. Since, we've been together <laughs> since 1998, a long time. 16, 16 years. years. Um, so I think that that trust was already there by the time I started working. And as far as Mike's music go, 
I can't, I mean, I don't have a lot of feedback for him, to be honest. I like it. It's great. Go, um, go on tour. Occasionally, <laughs> there'll be something with lyrics that comes up where we'll be talking about a specific word or something, and, and I'll help do some brainstorming. I do, yeah, I do ask you, though, yeah. like, as we're working on something, oh, what's the, you know, what's the, maybe there's a reference, maybe it's like Oh, wait, like wait, a, I, I want to interrupt you guys, because I want to play a quick video. Someone essentially asks this question, and okay. we're all about okay. community here. We want to get your fans in here. Yeah, we want to get them to ask questions and get them to interact with you, so I don't want to step. On let's do it. Okay. Let's do it. So let's bring in uh, Mike and Anna. Uh, sorry, that's you guys. Uh, <laughs> Twitter, Twitter, the Twitter feed went crazy uh, with questions. Uh, so we want to have you answer some of them. I'm going to pull some up right now. The first one is uh, they want to know what was your first impression of Chester when he joined Lincoln Park? Oh, that's a great question. So Chester, what, what the, uh, just by way of like giving you a little bit of quick history. Um, he, we had, all the rest of the guys in the band kind of knew each other from either growing up. I've known Brad since we were about 13. Rob went to a nearby high school. Dave and Brad were in, where they were college roommates. Joe and I went to college together. And then eventually we found Chester a few years later through a mutual friend. And he literally tried out for the band, came into a room and like sat and like, he, another guy came in and sang with us, and then he sang, and then a third, you know, and the third guy who went after him literally, like, kind of came in and just sang a little bit and, like, went out and, like, said to Chester on his way out, he's like, I don't even, I don't even know why I'm here. Like, if they don't pick you, they're crazy. Because he just, he heard it, too. And we, everybody, like, when you hear the guy sing, you went, wow, this guy's incredible. Um, but we tend to be a very, like, s we tend to be slow to make decisions, so... It was a thing where um, even though we knew he was a great singer, we also knew that being in a band together means that you have to spend a lot of time, together. Lot of time together. And we had to get along with the guy. So it took us um, longer than maybe was comfortable for him to actually invite him into the band. And, and, and Do you have like an extended training session where you saw how he would respond to you maybe Imagine if you're him, him like you're him. You've got your life like set up in, in Arizona. You drive all the way out to LA to like try out for this band. The band likes you, but not enough to like just tell you to be in the band. And then meanwhile, you're living out of your car for two weeks because the band is like hesitant to make a decision. I mean, I'm sure there's like a relationship, like boy-girl relationship, like uh, you know, a similarity there where you're like, well, why wasn't this? Why won't this person just ask me out? I feel um, like it's like a training for a restaurant job. It sounds like a little <laughs> bit, like two weeks as a, as a as a chef or something, and then they let you go. Yeah, he was he 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 understandably got kind of frustrated with it, but at the same time, um, I think we all knew that it, there was a there was some kind of interesting and an unusual magic there, and it, eventually he you know we asked him to be part of the band. Going back to what we were talking about before, in terms of the way that you two talk to each other, we have a video comment from JV, Jamie Silvestri, who actually lost her voice at your concert last night. So let's take a listen and see if we can understand what she's saying. Hi Anna and Mike. Um, I was just wondering how do your writing styles vary and what is the best piece of advice that you have given to one another that has helped progress your style? Thank you. That's amazing. Right. You want to start? I don't know. Um, I don't know what the different, I mean there's a lot of differences. Yeah, because it's... I mean lyrics are so different from writing lyrics are so different from even writing a po poetry ver even versus writing mm. a novel so um we were just talking a minute ago about how uh like it, it takes anna a really long time to write a tweet yes and because every word for her every word is so important when she's doing that i think that's more similar as weird as this sounds to like a lyric writing situation because you know that in some songs they've got very few words to get across a point. You have right. to really nail it in like maybe each line in a verse could be three words, it could be five words. Um, and in a book you have, in a, in a rap verse you have a lot more words and then in a book you have a lot more words. Um, and then it's a balance of like, okay, am I saying what I want to say and am I holding people's attention too? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they're all totally different animals. But I, I would say something that's vastly different that I'm always a little bit jealous of is that Mike has a whole band to be bouncing ideas off of. Totally. And I mean, <laughs> you don't I want do to Yoko have... that? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> um, but I, I mean, I have my, my critique partners. I have Mike. I have my agent. I have my editor. But when it comes down to it, this, this is my work. Mm -hmm. um, so final decisions on it are being made solely by me, where Mike has a whole group that they can kind of like 
yeah. talk it out and, and figure out creative things and come down to those final decisions based on how the group is collectively feeling. Right. Um, so that's one thing that I'm actually a little jealous of in a way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Let's bring in another fan who has a question about maybe some personal advice. This is uh, Irene. Hey, Irene. Hi, Mike and Anna. Hi. Hi. Uh, my question. <laughs> um, I was uh, the matron of honor in a wedding this past weekend, and you guys have been together for quite some time. What are some good tips you guys have for a newly married couple? Ooh, a newly married oh, couple. Oh, wow. That's awesome. What a great, great question. Um, I think one thing that I would say is um, expect that there's going to be growth within the individuals in the marriage throughout the marriage. Mm -hmm. um, and be prepared to uh, work with that growth and be prepared, you know, to adapt, to, adapt okay. to it. And if you find yourselves growing in different directions, see what you can do to kind of, you know, get back together, whether that's doing a little couples counseling or figuring out a new way to communicate. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there's, there's definitely, I, I, always, I always talk to like, you know, uh, my friends when they first get married or got married, it's always like what we usually end up in a conversation at some point about, you know, the kind of work that it takes to be in a relationship. And it's, it's not like, you know, I guess, it, you know, a lot of people grow up on this like fantasy version of what that's like thinking, oh, you're just going to find this person that's going to just magically... A soulmate. Yeah, you know. you're just going to magically be compatible forever. And that may be true to an extent, but it's not that you don't have to like, you know, work for it too, so... Yeah. And I think that there's, I mean, there's certainly some magic to a good healthy relationship, but there's also some work to it. There's magic to the work, though, yeah. right? At the yeah. end yeah, of the day. Yeah, absolutely, because it feels good day, when you're doing it. Exactly, at the end of the day, when you've worked for it and you feel like you've come to, at the very least, an agreement, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it makes everything kind of worth it and puts it in a perspective where you can feel really lost when you're not working. Yeah. And I would say one other thing is to um, enjoy the marriage, the two of you, before you have kids uh, for a while, because it's, that kids are total game changers. What, what, are, what so. are you getting at here? So. <laughs> it's it's a funny thing. Like like with I feel like we we being you know with the touring and the band and the opportunities to like for example travel that we have, we really took. I feel like we took a good we took advantage of that when we could, and then we had kids and now you know that's just a little more limited. And then at some point they get older and hopefully we can do it some more. I mean you know. You know, God willing, but the um, for our friends who like have just gotten married and they're like going on a honeymoon and they're going to take another vacation or they're going to do whatever it is, like that's the time to do it, yeah. right? Yeah. Actually, my fr our friend, we have a friend, uh, Tim Ferriss, who has a great book uh, came out years ago called The Four Hour Work Week, and Tim talks a lot about that. He talks about how um, a like an older mentality, uh, an older way of thinking about growing up and like retiring in particular is is that you'd get to a certain age you're going to save up and you're going to you know work hard now and you're going to save up and at some point you're going to retire and do all those great things that you imagine yourself doing or you want to do your your bucket list or whatever and he said think about how like how backwards that is like you should be trying to do as much of that stuff now while you're younger as you can and he gives tips in the book about how to kind of achieve that to find that balance and carve out space to be able to live out some of your dreams while you're, you know, younger and not potentially dealing with like, you know, your body being more achy or having trouble. Trouble. If you're 69, you've already retired and dealing you want to go climb now. Mount Everest. That's <laughs> yeah. kind of rougher than being, you know, 40 and doing. Yeah, it. absolutely. I, I want to ask because um, Lincoln Park came up, got very popular during the time of what was called like new metal rap mm -hmm. rock. Um, do you guys still consider yourselves to be a part of that genre? Did you ever consider yourselves to be part of that genre? Looking back, how do you reflect on that genre as a whole? I mean, there were a few bands that Lincoln being one of them that were really that really sort of I think symbolized that that. Yeah, uh, we we said even at the time that we didn't really feel like we ever held the flag for any genre. Um, it was just a, a I think for anybody who's deeply um, embedded in a, in a community or a genre or whatever it may be, the, the deeper you are into it, the more apparent the differences between one and the other are. So if I'm in a rap metal genre, then the differences between our band and the next band and the band over here 
are very clear and they're vastly different in my mind. Whereas from somebody on the outside, like they sound more similar. Mm -hmm. Makes sense? And that's true for, I mean, I talk to my friends who'd work in different fields, whether it be art or, you know, whatever. Uh, art is a great one. And it's like, oh, you know, these two artists are very similar to me. And they're like, no way, you know, there's such a big difference. And that's because they're in the weeds, mm -hmm. you know? So for us, it was that type of thing where we just felt like um, being where we were at, there's so, such huge differences between all those bands. Um, you know, in retrospect, probably not, but... I mean, you're uh, the most long-lasting of those, of those bands at this point. I mean, some of them are still together, but I think you guys still make hits. You guys, you know, there was an experimentation afterwards that you guys started working with other artists and expanded what you were doing, which was most likely very good for you, because I think that genre, has, critically, was, hasn't yeah. been looked upon that well in, in, in its aftermath, if you will. Well, yeah, we, I mean, we definitely, um, there were definitely elements of experimentation that I think uh, led to more of a long-term career-focused yeah. kind of um, trajectory. I mean, the bottom line is that we never looked at, like, we, all, we didn't look at, like, the next song or, like, the next album. We were looking way out into the distance and trying to say, okay, the most, most obvious decision being after our second album, we said, okay, we just made two albums that sounded very similar. We feel like deeply that we need to make an album now that sounds nothing like those. We need to go far outside of that. And then with the album after that, we, we decided to go even further outside of that so that, you know, like it or not, from the band's perspective, at least we were broadcasting, at least we were telling people we are capable of making many different types of music. We're interested in stretching ourselves and learning and we're still growing, we're not stagnant at all, and we're not going to make the same album every time, so don't even expect it. And we lost fans along the way. Yeah, did you ever feel like the fans of that genre gave you shit for those? Absolutely, intentionally, I mean, we intentionally let them go. Mm -hmm. You know, we said, you let the rap rock if, fans if that's go. all you guys want to listen to, we made two albums for you, and you've got those two albums, and you can always listen to those. If you decide to come along for the ride, though, the good news is there's going to be a lot of good, like, fun surprises. The bad news is it's not going to sound like that. Yeah. So do what you're going to do. But this is what we need to do in order to stay interested in what we do, you know, what we do as a band. Okay. <laughs> sorry. You happened to finish as I was trying to pull up another tweet, so I had oh, to give you some sorry. kind of response. No. This is the, that's the difficulty of doing live uh, Multitasking TV, live, internet. Yeah. yeah, what do you call this multimedia broadcast? You call know. it Huff Post Live. Oh yeah. Yeah, there you go. That's your, that's your, that's your commercial. <laughs> yeah, well, that's exactly what I was doing. I was trying to prep you for a commercial there. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> Guys, uh, I want to thank you so much for having this conversation with me. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Awesome. Let's thank yeah. uh, uh, the people from our community who joined as well. Thank you, Jamie, Irene, everyone from the HuffPost Live community who submitted questions via our comment well as well as Twitter. And uh, click on the links in our resource well below, guys, for more info on Lincoln Park's Carnivores Tour, their album Hunting Party, and don't forget Anna's book, Learning Not to Drown, which is available now. Stick around, we got a lot more coming up on HuffPost Live.